we were the number one recording artist of 1968, outselling everyone, including the Beatles. Something could happen on this show, you never can tell. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's Pam from the Rock and Roll Show with Pam and Joe. And I, um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm the director of the Dick Biondi film that's been in the works for about six and a half years now. And uh, I want to thank everybody who's been supporting us because we've been able to keep going and it's getting there. And uh, I have with me my, uh, my co-host, Joe Farina, who's also the director of communications and marketing for the Dick Biondi film. Joe, how are you? I'm doing great, Pam. Thank you very much for that awesome uh, introduction. And everybody out there, if you want to learn more about uh, the Dick Biondi film uh, that Pamela is directing and producing, uh, go to our website, dickbiondifilm.com. Uh, please join our Facebook group as well. We're over 1,300 members as of today. And also like uh, the Facebook, uh, Dick Biondi Facebook page, we're coming on to 4,000 likes, which is great. So our audience is, is growing and growing. And lastly, uh, we have a YouTube channel uh, as well. And last time I checked, we're over 300 uh, subscribers. So there's a, many ways you can uh, stay in touch with us and us to stay in touch with you to tell you what's going on with the Dick Biondi film, as well as the Rock and Roll Show with Pam and Joe. So if you and, like what we're doing, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're trying to build yes, it up. Absolutely, absolutely. Please do. We've got a lot of great stuff on there. Uh, clips from the film, as well as uh, clips uh, from the Rock and Roll Show. Now, it brings me, and Pam, uh, Pamela and I are, are so, so, so excited about uh, today's uh, special guest, I mean, he wanted, he's, a, he's a lead singer of one of the most successful bands of the 1960s. Uh, I mean, he's a fantastic singer, one of the most distinct voices of the 1960s, really. And I am just really, we, both of us are really honored and thrilled to introduce to you singer, songwriter, uh, legendary singer of Gary Puckett and the Union Gap, ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Mr. Gary Puckett. Gary, how are you? I am well. How do I live <laughs> up to that intro? <laughs> you well, can do I, it. We only speak the truth here. We only speak the truth. Uh, well, thank great you. Great to see you. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. I'm glad you invited me. Before I, I uh, ask you uh, the first question, I became a fan of your, of your music through Mr. Dick Biondi. Uh, when Dick Biondi was at uh, the oldie station in, uh, in Chicago, if you can't tell I'm from Chicago, from the accent and everything like that, um, from WJMK. And he used to play your music all the time. And that's how, it be, how I became a fan uh, of your music. I was wondering if you could tell us, uh, we're going to go back a little bit. Um, how did you get into music and, and what were your biggest influences as you were uh, uh, evolving into a singer, a musician, and songwriter? Well, that's a long, long story. Um, gosh, where do I start? Actually, my parents were really my, my first and biggest inspiration because they were both musicians and singers, and they probably would have pursued a career in music. Uh, but in the uh, in the early 40s, uh, tour buses were not very comfortable, and uh, they were cold and drafty, and uh, they didn't have bathrooms and refrigerators, and uh, so they kind of opted for a more normal life. But uh, both of them being musicians, my mom was a very accomplished pianist, and my dad was a great sax player, and they were in a band together uh, called the Dick Halverson Big Band. So. Um, music was a, a very big part of their lives when they were young people. Um, so as they decided to, they just took a more traditional path. They wanted a family. They wanted kids. They wanted a house. They wanted the white picket fence, you know, all that stuff. So uh, they, um, they wanted all of us kids. I'm the first. Uh, they wanted all of us to have a musical understanding so we were all required 
me particularly since I was the first and uh, mom sat me at the piano and she started giving me lessons, which really didn't work out very well. So I ended up taking lessons from somebody else, but still that was my beginning. And um, um, I, I was like any seven year old. I wanted to go out in the fields and chase garden snakes, you know, and things like that. So, so uh, it was hard to get me to practice the piano, but sooner or later uh, along came a guitar, which changed my whole attitude. However, before that, my dad was in barbershop quartets and they would come to the house to practice. And I was always amazed at the harmonies that they would sing. So, uh, I was quite, um, well, what's the word I want? I was sort of, I was captivated by it, you know, and uh, um, mom was in the Sweet Adelines. Uh, so I heard a lot of harmony in things when I was a kid. And as I grew a little older, along came rock and roll. So it, it, I started getting excited by Little Richard, Elvis Presley, the Everly Brothers, uh, Fats Domino. Uh, coasters, platters, uh, lots of them, you know, and uh, so it, it became something that I just, I wanted to do, but I didn't think that I would ever do it professionally. I didn't know that I could sing. I just knew that I wanted to, you know, so um, I was in a couple of bands before, uh, before my big success. I was in several, as a matter of fact, in high school, I was in a little band called the Redcoats, and we played at sock hops and, uh, you know, the like. Um, when I got into college, which I did, I went to college because of my parents. They wanted me to go on to higher education. They wanted me to be an educated person, you know, and to do better than they did. My dad did well in life, but, but he was a middle class guy and uh, worked hard to support a wife and five kids, you know, through his life. And they wanted me to be a doctor, a dentist, something like that. And uh, so I tried, but I was always uh, with my fingers on the guitar and in the music thing and working in the, the boys clubs. Uh, I lived in San Diego for a while, <clears throat> for a long while, as a matter of fact, but got there when I was about 17. And that's a military town. So we were always working for the military, for the enlisted men, you know, at uh, MCRD, um, the Marine Recruit Depot, at, at the Navy Yards, wherever. It was just, you know, it was a part of what I was doing and I was getting closer and closer, you know, to wanting to make a career of it. Still trying to do the school thing, but um, at some point I just got totally frustrated with it and just tossed my books and said, I'm gonna go for something else, I was more into being a guitar player in a band, you know. So that's where it really kind of got started and uh, put together. We were a 12-piece band <laughs> for a while called the Ravens. And we had four horns and four rhythm section and we had four singers. And it was a lot of fun. And it was, uh, it was what's the word I want? It was, it was just plain out of sight, as we used to say, you know. <laughs> but you couldn't make any money because you had 12 guys, you know? Right. So we all made $5 a piece every night. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, then so, how did you start uh, the Union Gap? How did that all come about? Well, I, you know, the, the Ravens broke up finally and we, we became a four-piece band. And then we worked into the nightclubs in San Diego and there came a point where I was in a trio with two guys that were really good musicians. We had a real good uh, rock and roll R&B kind of mode going for us, but uh, the bass player and the drummer were always at odds about something. And finally I said, all right, I'm out of here. So uh, I looked around San Diego for, took me months actually to find the guys that would become the core of mm -hmm a group that was going to be called the Union Gap. Started out being called Gary and the Remarkables for lack of a better title. But it was workable, uh, a working title as such. So uh, we, um, you know, got a, a big enough list of songs, repertoire, that we could go work in the nightclubs and uh, do what we needed to do. Some of the guys were married. Um, 
And it continued for a little while until I went up and got a, uh, an agent from Los Angeles said, come and see this band, you know, and, and they said, well, okay, we'll come down and see you. And meanwhile, uh, they put us on the road because they said, well, you're pretty good. Um, you know, we'll see what we can do for you. We went to uh, Van Nuys uh, in Los Angeles. We went to Seattle, which was where it was February. And I kept thinking, what am I going to do to have some success in the world out there? Because I wanted to record. I wanted to get out and work with all the, the current groups of the day. And... Um, we were all wearing the same stuff on stage, on the, on the street. It was all, well, you'll probably remember, platform shoes, hip huggers, bell bottoms. Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. Pais Paisleys, <laughs> uh, fringes, others. Yeah. And I thought, you know, oh, and that's when holy jeans started coming around. Everybody was ripping up their jeans and things like that. And uh, so I thought we got to be different somehow in order to uh, catch somebody's eye, you know, and that's when I thought of the idea of wearing the Union soldier outfits. Okay, and, I was wondering about that. And I, I grew up, actually, my formative years were in the Yakima Valley in Washington State. And that's where uh, Union Gap is. Mm -hmm. And when I thought of the Union soldier outfit, I just went, Union Soldier, Union Cap, that makes sense. I've got a name, I've got a look, we're ready to go, guys. So I took everybody and went to Tijuana uh, with an outfit that I rented from Western Costume in Los Angeles. <laughs> and found a little tailor who made these outfits for us. And uh, he did a, a great job. Finished the outfits with boots and pants and stripes and hats and things like that. And... Um, called it the union gap and people would go, what does that mean? You know? And I, I, I would say, well, what does Rolling Stones mean? You know, what, what does any of it mean? It's just a name, you know, but eventually everybody loved it um, because it was a lot of fun to be on stage in costume, if you know what I mean. So uh, yeah. we went to work in a club in San Diego called the quad room where I had worked previously with the uh, trio called the outcasts. And, and um, we started having lines from 9.30 at night until um, 12.30 at night. So it was very successful and uh, then put together a portfolio. And that portfolio included, <coughs> excuse me, included um, lyrics that I had written, uh, a demo of me singing, photos of this new band uh, called The Union Gap, and took it to every record company in Los Angeles. Good for you. <coughs> it finally worked. We went to every one, <laughs> every one of them. Oh I my found, goodness. found a guy by the name of Jerry Fuller, uh, who was at Columbia Records. Do you know Jerry's name? I believe Jerry, um, Jerry uh, wrote or co-wrote co some of your biggest hits as well, or produced them as well, is that right? Both, yeah, he wrote and produced. But he had uh, made his big success and in entry into the, the music business in, in reality, I'll say, um, by writing a song called Traveling Man that Ricky oh, Nelson wow. 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 Yeah. And it sold hey. about four, four million copies. And so uh, Columbia CBS Records uh, hired him to find talent, write songs, produce records. And uh, I walked into his office when he was putting the nail in the wall to hold up, to, to hang up his uh, gold record award for Traveling Man. And I knocked on the door and he looked around. He said, come on in here, man, sit down. I, I said, what is that? He says, that's a gold record award. And I said, I have never seen one of those before. May I see it, please? So he says, yeah. And I looked at it and I thought, that's really impressive. And I just said to him, would you please, please take a look at my portfolio, you know, and he did, and he liked it. And he said, where can I see this band? So he came down to see us in San Diego and we sat out in the bowling alley, which uh, you had to walk into the bowling alley to get into the nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. we sat in the booth there and we discussed and uh, he said, let's go make a record. You know, so I thought, hmm, it looks like something could be happening. So uh, he came back about, four or five weeks later with contracts and we sat in the bowling alley again and signed contracts right there. 
just just explain to everybody what that felt like. I mean, come on, this is the moment, you know, you, you could see your dream is about to take shape right now. And what did that feel like? Well, it felt wonderful. I think I was a little cautious in so much as, you know, it, so far it, it was looking positive, but it hadn't actually happened yet. But when I saw the contracts, I'm thinking, you know, this is actually serious and we could be on the way. We have to have a great song. We have to have a great record, all the, you know, other elements of it. But uh, Jerry happened to have a song in his hand that had been uh, written by a couple of fellas from Nashville, Jimmy Payne and Jim Glazer. And um, they had a record with it. It was called Woman, Woman, Have You Got Cheating on Your Mind? Oh, yeah. I remember it well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was the first session, Woman, Woman, Have You Got Cheating on Your Mind, along with a song that I had written called Believe Me, and another Tim Harden song called uh, Don't Make Promises You Can't Keep. So it was a phenomenal day. That's just emblazoned in my memory, you know. It, it, the orchestra was all around the vocal booth and, um, you know, over here was the rhythm section, over there were the strings and the horns and all that. And it was fun to watch it happen. Glenn Campbell was there, uh, Howard Roberts, the jazz guitarist was there, Carol Kay, one of the Wrecking Crew members. The Wrecking Crew, yeah. yeah. I, I understand you did record yep. a couple of your songs with the Wrecking Crew, right? Yeah, many of the songs were many? with those guys. And, you know, they weren't called the Wrecking Crew then. Mm -hmm. That came a, a little later. But uh, many of those players, there were probably 15 to 20 of them that were the A players, you know. So they mm -hmm. were the ones that were the first call people for recording sessions. And um, we had many of them there that day. So it was, uh, it was, it was awesome. That's all oh, I can. That's and, exciting. And, and uh, a uh, year, what, in what year was this? Uh, it's late 67, early 68, it, yeah. around that time frame? Well, it was August of 67, August 17th, okay. that the first session happened. It was September 17th uh, that the first record was released. And it was a couple months later, we were getting what they called split airplay, because as you recall, 45 uh single records had an a and a b side and record i mean rather uh radio stations could choose which one they wanted to play and it was a little later that the record companies uh realized they should only have a one-sided record meaning the a sides on both sides that way the radio station can't choose but we were getting split airplay which in itself i thought was pretty good some were playing don't make promises some were playing Woman, Woman, and Jerry said to me one day, I think we might have to go in and record again because we're getting this split airplay and it's kind of working against itself. Um, turns out there was a disc jockey program director in Columbus, Ohio, by the name of Bob Harrington. <coughs> and Bob Harrington, <coughs> excuse me, was a... Uh, Civil War historian. And I had fought with the record company. Fight is probably the wrong word. Negotiated with the record company to put a picture of us on our very first record. They kept saying, no, 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 we don't do that. We don't do that. I'm sorry. We, that's just not something we do for new artists. And I persisted. And finally, they said, OK. So anyway, um, this picture, being of the Union Gap, out in the forest with kind of smoke bombs going off behind us. Um, Bob Harrington at WCOL looked at that and said, this picture is absolutely phenomenal. I wonder what this record sounds like. So he auditioned it oh, wow. and he, he loved it. So he put it on his station in Columbus and it went to number one. That's oh. when the Cleveland office of Columbia Records called me in San Diego and said, guess what? You have a number one record in Columbus. We want to bring you here so we can promote this record and, uh, and make it a hit. So we got in the car, drove 56 hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a long time anyway. And uh, 
we, we got to Cleveland and went to work. They put us to work in a club in the basement of the Sheridan Hotel called Otto's Grotto. And we, <laughs> we did our normal nine to two every night. But in the daytime, I'd go out with them and we would shake hands at radio stations and things. And woman, woman climbed onto the charts at 80 something with a bullet, which was the little red star, if you recall. And, and we were off and running. So that's when it got really exciting. I'll bet. Oh, my goodness. That, that's amazing. And I mean, what a, what, a, what a story. And, you know, now you're on, uh, really, you're on the verge of so much uh, success as we, uh, you know, as we get into uh, 1968 for you and your band. I mean, what an amazing year uh, that, that was for you. And I was wondering a couple of things. Number one, if you could tell us, uh, you know, some stories about your, your, your smash hits like um, Lady Willpower and uh, Young Girl. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, 1968 was a great year for you because I believe you outsold the Beatles that year. Is that correct? They say that we, we were the number one recording artist of 1968, outselling everyone. And they always add, including the Beatles. But I always tell people, listen, nobody outsells the Beatles. They were just having a bad year. I don't believe it. I don't think it's true. But I'll wear the little badge, you know, as a badge of honor. That's for sure. <laughs> I, as a matter of fact, actually heard John Lennon sing Young Girl one time. So, <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. that was pretty wow. cool. That must, that is so special. And I mean, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about your smash hits like uh, Young Girl, Lady Will Power, uh, Only You? I mean, those are such magnificent songs. And every time I listen to them, Pam listens to them. Oh my God. I mean, even today, uh, the longevity and just the, the amazing music that, uh, that you made. I mean, it's just sensational. Well, Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I have to give a great amount of the credit to our producer, Jerry Fuller, who himself was and is a great singer and certainly a great, great songwriter. Um, I was fortunate to discover him in his office. He's given credit for discovering me, but he had a song in his hand that he knew was a hit. It was called Woman, Woman. Right. And we recorded it, it became the hit, and Jerry was just simply smart enough and a good enough songwriter and great enough talent that he was able to write Young Girl as a follow-up. He knew what the market wanted to hear. So I wish I could say there was a particular young girl, but it was about all young girls, you know, and uh, he, was, he was so talented, I should say he is so talented, that uh, he was able to write Lady Willpower as a follow-up to that. Did you know that Morrissey recorded Lady Willpower on his yeah. album? It was all about, he said, a good song is a good song, and we're doing good songs on this album. Uh, you can look it up online. You'll find it. Uh, he really copied uh, our recording of it, not in the same way, but all of the same notes. He didn't sing at the same key I did or whatever, but he really did a spectacular job of it. And it just shows that a good song is a good song. Jerry also wrote Over You, which just happened to be, a fellow came to a concert that I was doing one time and said, I'm doing a biography of Jack Webb. Remember Jack Webb? No. Dun, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Man. Yes. He said, I have to tell you, he said that your voice and your record and recording of Over You were his favorite of all time. So uh, Jerry is a talented guy, and I just give him all the credit for, uh, you know, really understanding that uh, all these elements together made uh, lots of uh, hit records. Fantastic, really. Yeah. I mean, uh, so many talents, and luckily the fates were aligned, and you guys came together at the right time. So, well, you know, a little bit of divine guidance there, I think, because yeah, we were all over the streets of Los Angeles for six days, you know, and I mean, I was just tired. I was just discouraged. I, I just, I wanted to go home. We're in the car. We're on the way to 
Highway 405, right on Hollywood Boulevard. And I, I saw CBS on the side of a building. I said, wait a minute, stop the car. If you have to go around the block and you know, avoid the cops, do wow. that. Good for you. I said, I'll be right back, I'm sure. Nobody wants to see me or hear us. And I went inside and I said to the lady, uh, listen, you wouldn't want to hear a new group, would you? And she said, well, wait a minute. And she did that, um, uh, what was that bit by uh, Lily Tomlin with the phone thing, you know, one ring, yeah. you know, and she plugged, <laughs> plugged, plugged and said, go down the hallway there and turn right. and You'll find a, a door down there with a guy by the name of Jerry Fuller. That was the divine guidance right there. Great. That's fantastic. Honest to God. And persistence pays too, you know, it's a big part of it. You were yeah. diligent. You kept going. You didn't yeah, give up. That's, that's right. That's what everybody needs to do in life. Keep on going. That's right. <laughs> and you're, and you're still going strong. Uh, you're still going strong today and which is dynamite. And I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, your future plans once uh, the pandemic ends and we're kind of, you know, back to normal. I know a lot of the musicians and artists that we speak to, you know, they're, they're just itching to get back on the road or into the uh, recording studio. I'm sure you kind of echo uh, those uh, same kind of thoughts as well. It's true. There's not much more that I can say than that. Um, you know, it's been, see, the, our last date was March 8. So what is it going on eight months, you know, since we last actually had a concert? And all of the dates that we had set up in the springtime got moved into the fall, and then they got moved into next year, and everything has just been changed. We're starting to see some dates be offered back onto the calendar so I'm looking forward to it. All the boys, I miss them. They're, they're my good friends and we're brothers in music and, and um, you know, a lot of love between us because they are great. Uh, one guy, Woody Lingle, is from uh, South Carolina. Jamie Hillbolt is from Austin, Texas. And Mike Candido is from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. And I'm in Clearwater, Florida. So it's hard for us to get together in something like a pandemic, you know, but we look yeah. forward to hanging out because we're a, we're a good hang and we're a great band. So, yes, we're looking forward to all that. I've got a new little CD out there that I call Love Songs uh, that if anybody wants to pick it up, they can find at my website, which is GaryPucketMusic.com. And uh, I'm going to put together a couple more. That's awesome. I'm glad you're still doing things like that. You know, keep, keep the music coming. And, uh, <laughs> you know, what, that's all we can do at this point, right? Yeah. But let uh, me just ask you, Gary, um, did you ever meet Dick Biondi? Did, I, are you familiar with Dick? You know, we were, we're doing a documentary about him. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm certain that I met him in Chicago, probably went to the station. Um, I don't have great recollections of it, but, you know, he was one of those iconic guys, you know, so we were able yes. to... Uh, meet the cousin Brucies and the Dick Biondis and the Dick Heathertons and, uh, or, you know, all those, all those uh, radio sorts that did us well. Yes, they did. Yeah, <laughs> but certainly. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, grew, I, I was born in 1972. I'm a big music history buff. And, but I, I imagine uh, in the 1950s and the of course the 1960s, the, the crucial role that uh, the DJs played, uh, in, in the careers of uh, a lot of those musicians and, and artists, because our odds are like with Dick Biondi, you know, if they, if they, if this DJ played your record, odds are it was going to be, um, it was going to be a smash hit. I mean, that's so, so it's just a di kind of a different, uh, you know, today is much, much different. Whereas back then the DJ played such a vital role in, in all that. Well, probably the entire role, you know, I mean, the record companies work the record and they put it in the music stores and all that kind of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> that was all great. But, uh, you know, we didn't have TikTok. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have Facebook, Instagram, you know, and name all the rest, uh, you know. So all that stuff has changed the whole thing incredibly, you know. So uh, that's um, right. <clears throat> yeah, I was a part of something that I think was uh, quite 
I don't want to say unusual, but, uh, you know, we, we saw the end of recording tape, basically, you know, and uh, it all went into the digital world and all that kind of stuff, you know. So uh, stereo was discovered during our era, you know, that kind of stuff. That's right. I remember the AM radios. I mean, yep. that's where Dick got his start. And uh, my film is actually about the era of, you know, early rock and roll and radio and the way it was and um, sure. as well as a tribute to Dick. So, um, you know, it's, it's a story for all the baby boomers, really. It's all of our story. Yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, but we, this has been really fun having you on the show. Um, Thank we you. Just, yeah, we, I, I really learned a lot today about you. I mean, I was already a fan, but I, you really told us the whole story and you put us there and that was great. I love it. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed. I enjoyed I it. Absolutely. And Gary, before, before we uh, uh, forget and before, uh, before I sign off, if you could tell uh, our viewers, our audience, uh, how they can stay connected with you. Well, we have a Facebook, um, I guess we'll call it the fan page. You know, it's the, the, uh, the original Gary Puckett and the Union Gap fan book. Uh, a, a fan page on Facebook. We also have the website GaryPucketMusic.com, which displays the things that are available and has all of our dates. And uh, I think my web guy is pretty darn good, and he keeps it all updated and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll put the link to this on the website as well as on the fan page. What Thanks. else? I think that's about it uh, for me. Okay. That, that, Wonderful. That, that's awesome. And, and uh, before, I sign, before I sign off, uh, number one, uh, let me say, Gary, that uh, since, uh, you know, since we first connected, you really, the first impression I got uh, was you're really a, a, a down-to-earth uh, class act, and, and uh, it was just a really a real honor and pleasure for, for Pamela, Pamela and I to, to speak with you and meet with you. And uh, I've known about your music uh, since about 1979, 1980. And I've been a really big fan uh, of your music and it's longevity is just incredible. And, you're, and as I said earlier uh, in our intro, your voice, I mean, the band was magnificent, but your voice, I think, is one of the most uh, distinctive, one of the most mm -hmm. incredible voices of the 1960s. I don't think there's any doubt uh, about that. And uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, before I depart, Pamela, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Joe. And everybody out there, stay healthy, uh, stay safe. Uh, be sure to follow uh, the Rock and Roll Show with Pam and Joe and the Dick Biondi film on Facebook. We have a Facebook group, Facebook page. We have a YouTube channel. Uh, check out Gary's website, GaryPucketMusic.com. He also has uh, a Facebook page as well. And uh, until next time, everybody, thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, great seeing everybody. Mwah. See you next time. Bye.